morning, church. You made it. You made it through Thanksgiving. You made it to Advent. Today, I'm so excited. I'm fired. This is my favorite time of year. And if you can't tell, this, this, this is the season where we first focus on hope, and then we're going to focus on peace, then joy, and then love. And today is going to be awesome. If, if you're new to the faith, by the way, and this is something that you haven't really gone through before, Advent literally means the arrival. It means the coming. And we just sang about it. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, right? Can you hear the longing? Even that minor key, it's like, how long, how long, oh, Lord, before you come back and redeem us? Or in the first case, for them, how long will you tarry before you send the Messiah? We're looking for the second Advent, the return of the King. He's already made all things right for those who accept him, but there's coming a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And today we celebrate the hope that that brings. And each week we light a candle. So let me have the chosen one come up this week. I believe home from college, Mimi Holland. Y'all give her a hand. She's going to be our candle lighter today. All right. Since you're an adult and you can handle flame, I just, I'm not even going to get in the way. Pick any of these three purple. Yes. Any of those. Okay. All right. So you push. Oh, goodness. Yes. Push this forward and then click that. I think. Yes. Oh, not that candle. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You can do it. I, just, I had to do that. Awesome. This is the candle of hope. Each week, we will light a new candle, and then on Christmas Eve, you'll notice the addition. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you. Awesome. You'll notice the addition of a white candle right here, the Christ child on Christmas Eve. Going to be so, so exciting. So here, as we think about hope, I want you to think back to your childhood about the one toy you hope for more than anything. Some of you are nodding. Some of you are grinning. Some of you are sad because you didn't get it. I'm sorry about that. Don't mean to bring up painful memories. Can you picture it? What was the one toy that you were so excited about? Anybody care to share out loud? If, if not, I'll share mine. Because <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, really? Like a live one? All right, that's cool. For me, I was so excited because I go way back to 1980 for this Christmas. And you may remember a specific record-breaking sequel movie came out. We all know that Rocky IV is the second greatest movie of all time, second only to any movie in the Star Wars saga. And in May of 1980, a movie came out called The Empire Strikes Back. And every kid that Christmas had to have one toy, this toy right here. Anybody remember what this is called? The ADAT, right? Yes, the Imperial Walker. Anybody know what ADAT stands for? Bonus points. All-Terrain Armored Transport. Only the nerds get that, but I was so excited. And we were opening presents, one after the other. And this Christmas, I got down to pretty much the end, and I looked under the tree, and none of those boxes fit what I had hoped for. What I had put on that Christmas list, right? You know what I'm talking about? Finally, we opened the last present. A little tear came down my face. Oh, wait, there's one more hiding behind the tree. And you remember how excited you were when you got the ad at. And I want you to, y'all think I was excited? Well, the fact that I still have it <laughs> should tell you all you need to know. Even missing the gun, the chewed up thing with the, with the dog eating it and stuff. I, st I loved it. I slept with it. I kept it. I pet it. I call it George. This, this was the culmination of hope, right? I was so happy because hope had been realized. You see where I'm going with this? Had I not been wishing and longing and waiting, this would have just been one more present under the tree. But because I was longing for it, like every good Christian boy does, and waiting for this, this was my favorite toy. I still have it. I can't wait to pass it down to my grandchildren and their grandchildren. If the Lord tarries, it's going to be one of those legacy gifts. And just like that, Israel was longing for a Messiah, maybe even greater than they were longing for this toy. This season, we can learn a lot from children by watching how they express hope, how they have that childlike innocence, that childlike wonder. Nothing says hope or wishful thinking more than a child's Christmas list. You know what I'm talking about? The stuff that's on there, I, 
My son told me last night he wants a motorcycle. You keep dreaming that dream, son. That's good. Dreams are good. There's nothing wrong with that. He's hopeful. Today, as we explore hope, we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 9. You can go ahead and find it and just kind of hold your place there because I want to set the context for what we're about to read. There's a reason why this is a classic read every year at this time. Isaiah was living in a dark time. Things were not going well. There was darkness all over the land. There was corruption. This was about 740, 750 years before Jesus was born. And this is probably one of the most famous Old Testament prophecies focusing, looking forward on the birth of Jesus. The world that Isaiah was living in was full of gloom and doom. There was darkness in the land. There was corruption in the government. There was a a need for a redeemer. And they had felt almost like God had turned their back. So when Isaiah writes chapter 9, he is giving something that the Jewish people wanted more than anything. He is offering hope. Hope that a Messiah would come and one day make all things right. The birth of the Messiah was what they were hanging their hope on, and that is what we still hang our hope on. So look at me, Isaiah chapter 9. I'm going to read first from the NKJV, and then we'll switch over to the MSG. Starting in verse 2, he says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Incredible, deep passage. So much going on, so much reference. We talk about the millennial kingdom coming and the throne of David. How has this happened yet? Is this still to come? There's so many ways that people look at this. I can't wait. Look at the message translation to kind of have a a fresh perspective. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. For those who lived in a land of deep shadows, light, sunbursts of light. For a child has been born, for us, the gift of a son, for us. He'll take over the running of the world. His names will be Amazing Counselor, Strong God, Eternal Father, Prince of Wholeness. I love that. His ruling authority will grow, and there will be no limits to the wholeness he brings. He'll rule from the historic David throne over that promised kingdom. He'll put that kingdom on firm footing and keep it going with fair dealing and right living, beginning now and lasting always. The zeal of God of the angel armies will do all this. Wow. That is so awesome. I love this. All right, so remember, Isaiah is writing this about 740 years before Jesus is even born. And he is going through basically generational bad leadership. We'll just call it like that. He's got Ahaz, and there's, there's Jotham, and Uzziah, and several wicked or ungodly or, or corrupt kings have gone one after the other, and they have been leading the people away from God, and the people now need hope. They're desperate. And that's the first lesson for us today. In the darkness, we need the light of hope. Every one of us. It's not just for them back then. I mean, we look around. This was a dark time in history, but we still feel the full weight of sin. We still see wars. We still see conflict, right? We still have struggles. Just like back then, if they were to survive, God was going to have to intervene. He had to intervene in your life to bring you back from sin, to buy you back from death and the grave. So this passage is making two huge statements right out of the block. The first one is it acknowledges the brokenness and darkness that we live in. It was back in Isaiah's time. They surrounded Israel. There was sin. There was corruption. But the second thing that it pronounces is there is a hope of a dawning light coming in the birth of the Messiah, the birth of a child, a prophecy 700 years into the future that the Messiah would come and one day make all things right. And the Jewish people in the Old Testament needed to hear this message because, frankly, they were wondering if God had forgotten about them. They needed a Savior. The society was crumbling and people needed hope. Now, what I think is really cool about Isaiah's words is when you study the New Testament, you see Isaiah's words still creeping through. 
all the way over in Matthew, he echoes and reminds us of Isaiah's writings hundreds of years later. So Matthew makes this cool connection between Isaiah, 740 BC, and the events he is witnessing here, the, the birth of the Messiah that is in his, his domain where he is living, he's seeing prophecy fulfilled. And that is one of the coolest things. He's, he's talking about what had just taken place in the manger in Bethlehem. He writes this, look with me, Matthew 1. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, there we go, saying, behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which is translated, God is with us, right? So if you're new to the faith, or maybe you're watching online and you just kind of stumbled upon this, what's happening here is there is a young Jewish man named Joseph. And Joseph is betrothed to a young Jewish lady named Mary. There's just one problem. Joseph is about to have to make a very hard decision. Betrothal back then was much more serious than our engagement. It was very closely aligned with marriage at this point. There's just one problem about this. Mary is already pregnant. And back then, that was insanely taboo. So Joseph, being a righteous man, decided to call off the wedding quietly. He's laying in bed, and an angel comes and visits him and says, Joseph, I want you to go ahead with the wedding. Because, believe it or not, the child that she is carrying is not from another man. She has not been unfaithful. This child is born of the Holy Spirit. Never happened before. This is something incredible. And Joseph makes a choice that no other man would probably do. He agrees to go forward with it. All these events took place to fulfill more prophecies. The prophecies of the Old Testament claimed that a child would be born, a virgin would be the mother, and it would be a light in the darkness and a hope for all people. And the child will be called Emmanuel, God with us. This prophecy tells us hope is on the way. The hope of all mankind, okay? So this is radical. We look back and see this 2,000 years ago. Yeah, we know the story. They didn't. This is unbelievable. They're like, what? She did what? She's pregnant? The whispers. The gossip. The insinuation behind her back. Joseph, what are you doing? You're already starting your family with an unfaithful woman? Wow, good luck with that marriage. Think about the, the, all that was going on behind the scenes. And he makes this choice to say, you know what? We are going to walk forward because the angel's given us his word and we trust. Hope of all mankind. The center of the Christmas story is now focused right here, squarely on the birth of Jesus. He is going to be the fulfillment of all of Israel's hope that God would push back the darkness. I think one of the reasons Christmas resonates so much with our hearts is because we can identify with this. Every one of us can identify with the need for hope. Every one of us admits we are living in a hurting, broken, <laughs> messed up world. We see darkness. We see corruption. We see sin so easily entangling good people, leaders, people in the church. We see war and disease and conflict and oppression and hate. We see all of this. We, too, know we have to have light to come into the world, and that is found in the Christ child. See, Christmas is a reminder to us that whatever it is you are hoping for, whatever it is you're lacking, whatever it is you're needing, can be found in the manger. Healing, restoration of relationships. Some of you just went through Thanksgiving, and you needed that. You were dreading seeing family. Man, I get it. Maybe you needed a reminder that it's time for forgiveness. Maybe you needed a reminder that it's time to make a fresh start. The little boy is going to sit down and the man is going to stand up. And I'm going to be that faithful follower of Christ. I am going to move forward in hope. See, hope is not the absence of conflict. Hope is not the absence of pain and struggle and difficulty. Hope is the result of the presence of God. And that's our next truth grenade for us. God's presence has come to give us hope. God's presence has come. Emmanuel, the one who is God with us, has come. You know why we don't like hope? It's because it often takes longer than we think it should to be fulfilled. And hope takes patience. And like the Jewish people, hope required so much patience. How do we feel about growing our patience? <laughs> Anybody like it? No 
thank you. Most of us, we, we can't stand it. We can identify with this prayer right here when we talk about patience. God, I pray you bless me with patience. Not opportunities to be patient. I've got plenty of those, and they're not working. I want the actual patience, right? Can we just skip all the lessons and just dump a truckload of patience onto me? Or to put it in a, a pet owner's way, those of you who have your pets, stay, stay, stay. Okay, okay, right? Just remember, that dog knows when you sleep. He knows where you are. We don't like patience. We don't like to hold out for hope because hope requires patience, which requires maturity. You'd be proud of me. Yesterday, we drove all through the day, late into the night to get home to be here for church. Got to see Amy's family. And I didn't lose my cool one time on the road. Not once. I let Amy drive. <laughs> True story. She did great. You did great. We made it. We made it. As I was, <laughs> last night she did hit a deer. Yes. The deer hit you. And that's different. That's different. By the way, there's a deer on the side of the road. If you want you to know. This week, as I was looking at this, I learned something about patience. There is a plant that grows in southwest United States. Some of you may recognize it's called the agave americana, also known as the century plant. If you don't know why, you're, you're, you'll understand here in just a second. This is a plant that thrives in the most weird place, in rocky, dry, arid, mountainous desert regions. That's it. When it looks like everything else would die, this plant seems to thrive. And the leaves can grow, look like aloe leaves. They can grow almost a foot wide, each individual shoot. And the whole plant can be six feet across, sometimes eight or ten. And it can grow to be six feet tall, just this, this prickly bush that doesn't look like it's doing a stinking thing for 10, 20, even 30 years. See, it has this bizarre, unusual reproduction cycle. Oh, you're going to love this. For 20, 25, even 30 years, this plant literally appears to do nothing. It remains the same height. It bears no flowers, no fruit. It basically looks dead and dormant. But then, probably after you have given up hope on it and you feel like a century has gone by, something incredible happens. Without any warning, a little sprout blooms. And it grows seven inches a day. And it goes into this incredible, huge tree. It looks like a giant asparagus. Stick it up 25, even 30 feet tall. And these blooms at the top have these incredible yellow flowers that just blossom. And it is this beautiful, glorious blossom. And it lasts for three whole weeks. Do <laughs> you catch it? We have to wait 30 years to experience beauty of just three weeks. You want to talk about being patient. And just like that century plant, some of us are waiting for God. But God's greatest answers often come in his time, not ours, when we are hoping and longing and we are exercising maturity like Israel did. How long, O oh Lord, before the beauty of the Messiah is unfolded? How long before the beauty of a rare flower opens and we see this? See, Isaiah is a perfect example of this. He saw one day, way in the future, that God is going to bring a great light. He's going to offer salvation through the birth of a child, but it wasn't just 30 years. It would end up being centuries that people had to hold out hope. It wasn't until hundreds of years later that Matthew records Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. Jesus now is the very presence of God on earth, and he finally came to offer forgiveness of sins. So if you're new to the faith, that's the gospel. He came, that's the good news, to say, I will take your sin. I will literally break the chains of bondage. He came to break chains of darkness. He came to promise eternal life. God's promises always come through. Somebody needs to hear that today. He is faithful, and we can trust him. Our mission is to remain faithful to him, walking daily in integrity, walking daily in faithfulness. So you know i got to ask. How are you doing with that? Would you say you're walking faithful? Would you say you have integrity before the Lord? Perfect example of this is this famous golfer right here. Anybody recognize this guy? You can shout out his name if you do. Close, close. This is the great Bobby Jones. Here he is at the U.S. Open. I believe the year was 1925. And he did something no one thought any professional athlete would do. 
He went to the officials and he said, I think I accidentally bumped my golf ball. And I touched it. Didn't really move much, but it did just a tiny bit. And I just wanted to let you know that I'm going to have to lose a stroke on that. The officials said, we didn't see it. Keep playing. Bobby Jones says, what? You don't understand. I touched the ball. I, I know exactly where I touched it. I was right there on, on hole number 11. I violated rule 18. He holds up the coach and says, I violated it. I touched the ball. I moved it just ever so much. I cannot continue unless you take a stroke for this inadvertent accident. When he finished the game, the scores were tallied up. He lost the U.S. Open by one stroke. All the news sports writers came around and gathered. They were, couldn't wait to interview the great Bobby Jones. Says, what is going on? You're so incredible. Your integrity. No one's been this faithful. You've been, you've, you're so honest and all that. He says, stop it. You might as well praise me for not robbing banks. Because that's what I did. I was honest. You don't praise a bank robber for, oh, thank you, you didn't rob that bank today. Good for you. Well done. He said, guys, I was just being honest. This is what we're supposed to do. Y'all, this right here is where God desires us to live faithfully before him at all times, not just when others see it, not when others are watching. That's integrity. That's character. But know this, all these people out here, the vast majority who are not in a house of worship today are watching. They are watching us. We are the ambassadors for Christ. They are watching this. They want to see, does our faithfulness, does our integrity match what we say? When we read Isaiah's prophecy, we read it every Christmas, it's because of seeing God's faithfulness in the past that we have hope for today. It's because of these hundreds of prophecies that we can have hope. When our kids say, Dad, why do you believe this book? We can say, because every single one of these prophecies has come true. We were at our family's yesterday down in Atlanta, and we got a, 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 a family member, I'll just say that, and they came up and they said, you know, I heard that there was a prophecy in that book, talk about the Bible, that actually came true and was spot on. And I said, yeah, and not just one, <laughs> hundreds. It's incredible. And I was like, you know what? This is how the lost world is. Like, is that book really true? Y'all, this is why it's so important to study the Old Testament prophecies. Because every time God comes through and fulfills them, we can say, that's my God. He is right on time every time. He fulfills the prophecy. Not only does him in the past give me hope for the present, but it gives me trust for the future. The Apostle Paul talked to us when he wrote to the early church in Rome. He said this, he says, For whatever things were written before were written there for our learning, that we, through the patience, there's that word again, through the comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Paul said everything, everything that had been written in the past, all the prophecies, all the fulfillments, is there to teach us how to hold on to our faith in the dark days. So if you are struggling, if you are going through Hades sideways, don't lose hope. Hang in there. God will come through. He will move on your behalf. He does answer our prayers. What was written in God's word gives us encouragement and hope today. It gives us endurance and stamina. And when things seem to be spinning out of control and the darkness seems to be winning, man, I get it. And it seems like evil is prospering. And only the bad are getting ahead. Don't believe the lie. God has not surrendered his throne. He is still Abba Father. He is still seated on the throne. His prophetic words will come true. The second advent is on its way. This is why we see the fulfillment of the birth of Jesus, and it reminds us God always can be trusted to come through. He always meets us in our greatest time of need. And that's our final truth for us today. Because of Jesus, we have hope. It's all because of Jesus. The Christ child, this changed everything. There's so many distractions in the Christmas season. You see it when you walk in a store. You see everything, whatever, out there taking the attention off of Jesus. And we know this message is a reminder of hope. This right here, Jesus' arrival in the manger, the fact that we light this first candle changes everything. So when you walk through those stores and you see people looking like this, and when you hear those horns being honked on the road, remember, we have hope. 
Our light should not shine like everyone else's light. Our light should stand out in the darkness. Our light should be such that there is no mistaking. We are part of God's family. So you know I got to ask, do you? Do you stand out? How is your light this season? You have room to improve? <laughs> Take a number. You're in good company, but improve. As we pray in just a minute, I want you to think about things that you can lay before the Father. He broke those chains. What addiction do you need to lay down? What struggle, what weight, what anxiety, what care do you just need to bow and just come give to the Father? Say, God, I'm done. You came to break those chains just like you broke the darkness and Israel's chains were shattered. I need that. So here's what we're going to do. I want to share one, one last story with you that is, that is just going to bless you. And I'm going to go ahead. Our musicians can come up. We're going to sing another song, and we're going to open the altar for prayer. This morning, we've been talking about hope. And just this week, I read, ironically, about an elderly woman named, wait for it, Stella Thornhope. Stella Thornhope was an, age, an, an older elderly, elderly lady. And she was having a rough Christmas season because, frankly, this was the first Christmas season that she would go through alone. Some of you have lost loved ones recently. I get it. She was starting to get depressed. She lived in a little cabin, not far, I would guess, probably from the foothills in Boone. And as she sat there, recalling how her husband had died a few months earlier from cancer, she looked across the street and she saw the sun was getting ready to set, no lights were on. It was just a few days before Christmas, and a terrible snowstorm had come in the night before. And she was sitting there alone, feeling depressed, and she said, you know what, I'm not even going to decorate for Christmas. Right as she had made that decision, the doorbell rings. True story, she goes to the door. She was stunned to see that a delivery man had made his way through the snowstorm and was standing there freezing cold on the front porch. He looked at her and says, Mrs. Thornhope? Yeah, that's me. Great. Could you sign right here, please? She signed it. She invited him in, step away from the cold, closed the door, and began to sign the papers. And she saw that the box was unsealed. And she says, do you know what's in the box? And the young man laughed. He opened the flap, and inside was this little guy. Oh, yes. A beautiful, adorable, golden Labrador retriever. The delivery boy picked up this little squirming ball of fur and he handed it to Mrs. Thornhope and said, Ma'am, this is for you. He's six weeks old and before you ask, yes, he is completely housebroken. All you have to do is love him, feed him, and let him out. This is your new companion. And she said, what? who sent this? She said, oh, there's an envelope here that will explain everything. This dog was actually bought last July while its mother was still pregnant, and it was meant to be a Christmas gift to you. Oh, and it comes with this book here. And he hands her a book that says, How to Care for Your New Labrador Retriever. She's stunned. She's trying to wrap her head around this. She's looking at the dog, looking at the, at the, the book, and she says, Who sent this to me? The young man was leaving. He turned, he looked at her and says, Ma'am, your husband sent this to you. Merry Christmas. She was stunned. She quickly sat down. She put the puppy in her lap and opened the letter, and it was from her husband. He had written it just three weeks before he had died, and he left it with the owners of the kennel to be delivered with the puppy as his final Christmas gift to her. And the letter was incredible. She just sat there. The tears flowed. She read it. It was so full of love and encouragement. Honey, be strong. And it ended with a vow that I am waiting for you in my father's house. And I can't wait to be reunited. She wiped away the tears. She put the letter down. Then she remembered she still had this little ball of fur in her lap. And she picks up the dog. And she says, well, little fella, it looks like it's just me and you now. What do we do? She said in that moment, she felt this amazing sensation of hope wash over her. She felt that joy and peace was entering her heart that was greater than her grief, greater than her loneliness. She said, you know what? She looked out the window and saw the lights were coming on in all the houses in her street. She heard the radio playing, joy to the world, the Lord has come. 
She says, I know exactly what we're going to do. And she picked up the puppy and she says, let's go downstairs. I've got something to show you in the basement. And there was a box of Christmas decorations full of lights, a small Christmas tree, and all kinds of things that were just going to impress this little furball. And then she said, you know what I want to show you the most is this right here. She held up a manger. She said, I think I will set this out because I now have hope. She goes upstairs, she decorates, realizing the timing of God was absolutely perfect. For the first time in months, she had hope because she realized God was right on time when she needed it. And just like that, God is on time every time. Don't give up. This message is for somebody who is right on the edge. Hold out hope. God can be trusted. His words are true. He is faithful. Today we know the light of the Lord has come. He has pushed back the darkness. Over 2,700 years ago, Isaiah wrote these great words. In a land full of deep darkness, a light has dawned. He is the source of our hope. Do you know him today? Would you like to? Maybe you know him and you just need to step a, a little closer to him. You can do that. His arms are wide open. Right where you are, very reverently, would you just bow with me? Father, in this moment, we thank you that you wrote yourself into the story. You became the hope bringer. You offered to take our sin on that cross. God, thank you for that. We accept it. We receive your gift that we couldn't earn, that we didn't deserve, but we're so, so grateful for. Holy Spirit, would you invade our life? Would you take control? We want to serve you. We want to live for you. We want to be a hope bringer in this dark world. We ask that you would just flare up within us, Lord. Fan those flames. Help us to live a bright, shining light for you. When people see us, God, may they not see just us, but may they see you burning in us. May our light be so contagious, so bright, that they can't help but ask us, what is it that makes you different? And we can point those people to you. Lord, we give you our burdens. We give you our cares, all the struggles, all the stress. We lay them at your feet because you said we could. Meet us in this moment, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.